Welcome everybody. I am Teresa Crick from the University of Buenos Aires. And it is with a lot of pride that I introduce the next plenary speaker of MCA 2021, my colleague, Miguel Walsh. Miguel got his PhD in our university in 2012 at the early age of 25. His thesis consisted of two outstanding contributions in the field of discrete inverse problems. The first one in ergodic theory, published earlier the same year in the annals, and the second in number theory, which appeared in Duke. These stunning achievements caught the attention of the international math community. He was one of the five recipients of the MCA prize in its first edition in 2013, together with awardees from Brazil, Chile, Colombia, and Mexico, and also received the ICTP Ramanujan Prize in 2014. After a Clay Research Fellowship stay in the UK, he decided, fortunately for us, to come back to our university, where he's a professor since 2018. Miguel has been working on the polynomial method and he will speak today about algebraic intersections in analysis. I hope you will enjoy his talk as much as I always do for his capacity to show the big picture and the bridges between the different fields in mathematics. So let me now pass the Zoom floor to our youngest plenary speaker, Miguel Walsh. Thank you, Teresa, for the introduction. So the title of the talk is Outbreak Intersections in Analysis. More specifically, I want to tell you about some common algebraic techniques that arise in a number of different problems in analysis. So the talk will have two parts. Both of them will have the same title. So in the first one, I want to tell you a few examples of some central problems that belong to different fields, but share a lot of connections between each other and can broadly be considered as problems in analysis. And these problems, while we have little or sometimes no idea about how to solve them in general, they have the common feature that when we look at simplified models, we can find elegant, relatively simple proofs that involve more or less the same kind of algebraic techniques. So then in the second part of the talk, I want to tell you about these specific techniques. I'll tell you one example of them, and in particular, the kind of obstacles that we face in trying to make them work in more complicated situations. This will actually lead us to the literal study of algebraic intersections in analysis. So more precisely to obtain good quantitative asymptotic bounds for the intersection patterns between algebraic varieties. So I believe that most of the things I will talk about involve simple statements that will be easy to follow, but there will be a few notations that I will need. So I will introduce it right away. So this is standard notation. So given a finite set, A, I will write this for its cardinality. Given two quantities, X and Y, I will use standard asymptotic notation of writing either of these two choices to mean that there is an absolute constant C such that X is bounded by C times Y. So X and Y can depend on some parameter and they change with this parameter. But for any choice of this parameter, this means that there is a fixed constant C such that X is bounded by C times Y. And then, as I said, this will be a talk that involves algebraic things. So in particular, it will involve the zero set of polynomials. So this is the notation I will use to refer to them. So given a field and a polynomial, I will write this thing there to mean the zero set of this polynomial. And more generally, if I have several polynomials, I will use this notation to refer to the common series of all these polynomials. This is all rather standard notation. Given an algebraic variety, I will refer to this standard notion of degree of a variety. But I will also need to use another definition, which is the following. So we will also consider the partial degree delta of v of the variety, which is defined as the smallest integer delta for which we can find polynomials of degree of most delta, such that v is an irreducible component of their zero set. So this is intended mostly to the people that are familiar with this kind of things. If not, just keep in mind that you have, we will have two notions of degree, the standard one, and then another one that has more to do with the polynomials that you need to define, to define the, the variety. 
And in particular, one motivation to bring this right away is that I want to advertise a conjecture about these things. Well, hopefully I still have everyone's attention. I have the following conjecture that goes like this. So if you have an algebraic variety of dimension D, how many singular points can it have? How many isolated singular points can it have? So the conjecture will be that there are a number of isolated singularities of base at most, a fixed constant, C sub n, that depends only on n, times this parameter, delta of b, to the power d, times the degree of b. So the reason I bring this conjecture right away is that on the one hand, it's an example of the kind of analytic versions of algebraic results that we need. We need a good asymptote on, on a basic algebraic quantity, which is the number of singularities of, a, of an algebraic variety. And this particular conjecture seems to be a stumbling block for a number of possible applications of, of methods related to what I'm going to talk about. And since the people that uh, work on these problems that one tries to solve come mostly from an analytic background, it's hard for us to figure out this particular question, although it seems to be rather important. And in particular, this is easy to prove for curves. So it's a good probability that it's true. So given that we have a broad audience today, just keep this in mind in case that this rings any bell it will be pretty useful. So let's now move to the proper talk, given this notation. And so as I said, I want to tell you a few examples of problems where, where this kind of techniques I want to talk about arise. Of course, I'm going to only develop the these things, I uh, only want to spend a few minutes on it in each of these problems. So I'm not going to say much about them, but what I want is to give you some sense of the, some feeling for the kind of uh, problems I'm talking about. So the first one needs little motivation is the study of theta functions. So the Riemann theta functions, the unique meromorphic continuation to the complex numbers of the function defined this way for points with real path greater than one. And of course, what we want to do is try to understand the distribution of its non-trivial series in particular. So what we have is that this leads us to the study of cancellation in exponential sums of the following form. So this thing here, an exponential sum e to the i times f of n, where f is simply t times log n for some real number t. So it's just the partial sums of the zeta function. Obviously, understanding the distribution of non-trivial series leads us to study this kind of uh, partial sums. But even though this may look, I mean, if you're not familiar with these things, this looks like a rather simple thing, perhaps, to study, just an exponential sums of a fixed smooth function. But it turns out that we don't understand these things very well. And in fact, even if we replace f here with a polynomial of fixed degree, our knowledge of such sums is rather limited. So even if you take just an exponential sum where the exponent is a fixed polynomial, we don't know enough about these sums. We definitely would like to, but we don't. And kind of shows the limitations that we have in understanding exponential sums. So that's the kind of question that arises out of the study of the functions. So of course, the Riemann hypothesis predicts that the real series have all all the non-trivial series have real part equal to one half, and a similar prediction can be made for analogous theta functions arise in a more general context. So, for example, for the classical theta function, as is well known, the Riemann hypothesis predicts a good formula for for the number of primes of a given magnitude. And in one of these uh, other contexts, for example, we have in the particular case of theta functions arising from projective non-singular curves defined by a finite field. The problem is equivalent to showing a good bound for the number of rational points of such a curve. It's just trying to establish this estimate here, where the main term is given by the number of elements of the field. And then we have a narrow term that is square root cancellation. So more or less, the idea is that the error term behaves like the error term of a, of a random object. And where the implicit constant is allowed to depend on the genus of the curve, this is what the subscript means here, that I'm allowing the implicit constant to depend on the genus of the curve. So of course, this simpler model is known and originally this result was established by Bale, but more to the point of this talk, an alternative proof was given by Stepanov and Bombieri, by means of a strategy now termed the polynomial method. So this was not known as the polynomial method back then, in fact, we usually refer to this as the Stepanov-Bombieri method, but uh, it's very much in the same spirit of a lot of different results and they all get the name of the polynomial method. So this quick review of a very well-known example is points out to some of the commonalities between the things I'm going to discuss. So you have some problem that is from analysis, perhaps some an 
intrinsic arithmetic interest in it, it's related with the study of exponential sums as another topic that will come on frequently. Bounding rational points on curves is another common uh, feature of this kind of problems. And when we look at the simpler model, a simple toy model, we see that we have some specific techniques that works quite elegantly to solve the simplified model of the problem. So second example, the, the first one is a big one. The second one is more personal. It's the one in which the way I personally got introduced to the polynomial method. But it's a very interesting question. So if you look at the set of squares in the first n integers, they only occupy p plus one over two residue classes for every odd prime p, in spite that the set is not too small. In fact, it has size more or less into the one half. Which, so if you think about it, the set of squares occupying only half residue classes means that you're taking away a lot of elements from your set. Yeah? For each prime p, you're removing half the elements more or less. And still, in the case of the squares, I mean, you, if you do this randomly, you will expect that you will be left with pretty much nothing after removing half the residue classes. But in the case of the squares, you're left with a pretty big set has size more or less than to the one half. Of course, the squares are not a normal example of a set. They have a lot of algebraic structure, obviously. And so this led to the health and bank condition independently written lab to put forward the conjecture that the only way that something so strange can happen of removing so many residue classes and still keeping your set big is for the set to have an irregular, is for the set to have algebraic structure. More precisely, the only way a big set of integers can have such an irregular distribution of residue classes for it to essentially be the image of a polynomial map. So to be precise, one instance of the conjecture goes like this. Suppose I have a big set S, and here, for example, by big, we can mean that it has size at least n to the one half minus c for some small constant c. And suppose that in, in spite of being this big, your set occupies only p plus one over two residue classes for every odd prime p. Then the conjecture is that S, the only way this can happen is that in fact, it must be the image of a quadratic polynomial. So the squares of some other quadratic polynomials, the only way that you can get a big set to have the structure. And this, uh, you could look at this and say, well, this is a cute problem. It's a very simple phenomenon that we don't squares to by few residual classes. It's interesting that they are the only one. It's much more interesting the fact that we have absolutely no idea how to prove this. And it's related with a number of interesting questions. So. On the one hand, we know, although we cannot prove that the squares are the only example, or image of quadratic polynomials are the only example, we know that a set that occupies a few residue classes must have size at most a constant times n to the one half. This itself is a consequence of an estimate on exponential sums known as the large sieve inequality. So when you look at things, questions like this about things about p, when you do a free expansion of p, you pretty easily turn these questions into questions about uh, exponential sums. But it's also strongly related with a problem in the Euphantian geometry. So the question of obtaining uniform bounds for the number of integer points that can lie on an algebraic curve of positive genus. So in particular, conjecture made by Smith, but it's like a folklore conjecture, not usually referred to as Smith's conjecture. But it's a bear, one of the most basic questions that analytic questions one can ask about uh, algebraic uh, curves. If you have a, a curve that has positive genus, can you obtain a bound that is uniform among all such curves? Something like a constant times n to the epsilon for any epsilon, something like that. So that's a big problem that we don't know how to solve. And it's very related to the, the problem I mentioned before. If you want to get an idea why, if you get something of positive genus that has a lot of points, and you have a rational curve that has a lot of points, rational curves occupy few residual classes. If the, if the genus is zero, then you get something rational. So it's, it is the image of a polynomial map. But if there were curves of positive genus that had a lot of points, then you could use this to, to try to build elements that contradict the previous conjecture. That's how the connection between these two things works. It's a, it's a we, interesting point that we have no idea how to solve so far. But again, if we look at the simpler form of the question, we can say something using the polynomial method. So we can prove the following variant that was also conjectured by Helfer and Venkatesh, and it says the following. If I have a set, now the set is not a one-dimensional set, it's a set in D dimensions. And suppose in D dimensions we have P to the D residual classes instead of just P in one dimension. And if our set occupies less than P to the K residual classes from some K that is strictly less than D, then 
what we can prove is that S must always lie in, this, in the solution set of some non-zero polynomial of degree at most a constant times, a, a, a constant power of the logarithm of N. So in fact, what we can prove is that in higher dimensions, whenever a set is very badly distributed in residual classes, in fact, it has to have a very strong form of algebra extraction. And as I said, the proof uses a polynomial method, similar kind of ideas than the, the stepanopov geary method. And in fact, under necessary additional conditions on the size of S, the polynomial obtained can be taken to have degree uniformly bounded. So this is another, so this is a second example of uh, how you start with some problem that is interested in involves a couple of things like exponential sums and rational points. We don't know what to do with them, but when we look at the somehow simpler problem, well, then the polynomial method kind of gives you a straightforward solution to it. So, well, we don't know what to do with the one-dimensional problem. There has been some work carrying out on it by Burgan, Green, Harper, and Hansen, but what it's really tough, seems very tough, is to find how to make this algebra structure that we're looking for appear. And one would expect that the polynomial method should play a role on this uh, one-dimensional version of the problem, but we still don't know how to do it. So it's another example of this. We don't know how to extrapolate it. And as I said, it's connecting with rational points. This would be considered a third example. So we cannot establish the bound I mentioned before, but we can prove this also using the polynomial method, that there exists a some fixed constant B, such that an irreducible algebra curve over the rational numbers that has degree D can have a mo at most a constant times n to the two over D rational points of height less than n. So what it, what it tells you, you have a curve of degree D, you can bound the number of rational points that this curve have in a manner that is absolutely uniform over all curves of degree D. So the constant is in the constant B here is independent of the curve. And it gives you this, the kind of uniform bound that, that I was talking about before. That it's easy to see that it's sharp, taking something like y minus x to the D. So this is just one result of a broad family of results concerning uh, this kind of estimates from rational points on curves and varieties. With work by Bombieri, Pila, Heath Brown, Salberger, Ellenberg, Ben Ketich Browning, Castro, Kluker, Stigman, Nikushin, and many other authors. So these are some examples of, of the kind of applications of the polynomial method I'm talking about. We, I'm going to move to another one that got a lot of attention for a very good reason that I'm going to try to explain. So another central problem that we don't know how to solve yet is the Kakea problem. And again, I'm trying to give you a feeling for the kind of questions I'm talking about. Don't worry, of course, if the details you're not following because I'm just trying to give a general feeling. But of course, if you have any specific question about these things, just let me know. And uh, so we have this other problem, central problem in fractal geometry, which is the Kakea problem. This is the following. If you have a set K that contains a unit light segment pointing in every direction, then the dimension of K has to be equal to N. So the only way that you can have a set in a Euclidean space that it contains a unit line segment pointing in every possible direction is for your set to be rather big. Uh, so what I mean by dimension here could be the house dimension, could be Minkowski dimension, any of those would be a great result, but we don't know how to prove them. It is known that you can have a Lebesgue measure zero, but the idea is that it cannot be too small, too much smaller than that. It cannot have dimension less than n. So this question is actually deeply related with problems in harmonic analysis questions about exponential sums. So it's deeply tied with the well-known restriction problems that what they, they look to understand the, those functions whose Fourier transform are supported on a specific surface. So for example, the surface of the sphere. And so to give a quick idea of how that connection works, if you look at a function supported on the sphere or you just look at the neighborhood of a sphere and you partition it, that neighborhood into little slabs, each of those slabs Will, the characteristic function of each of those slabs will, by the uncertainty principle, be pretty much uh, the Fourier transform of a tube pointing in the normal direction. So if you take all those slabs, the function that you get in physical space is a union of tubes. And if the Cahier problem was false, you could get these tubes to overlap a lot to each, with each other and get a function that is kind of abnormally concentrated and that will con contradict the restriction conjectures in harmonic analysis. So of course, I mean, I'm talking about tubes and the conjecture is about unit light segments, but this, this comes from the fact that you just take smaller and smaller slabs and then the tubes get thinner and thinner and then you get lines pointing in every direction. So this is related with exponential sums, you know, just uh, this kind of restriction problems, but you will think that it doesn't have that much to do with the problems I was mentioning before. 
But in fact, it is also connected with this other, other form of exponential sums. So it's also a consequence of the following conjectural bound known as Montgomery's conjecture. So again, uh, I don't expect you to dwell too much on the exact statement here. What I want you to, to notice is that this is a conjecture that, well, it predicts that you have a lot of cancellation in the sums. And these sums, if you look at them clearly, they are motivated by the theta function itself. So you're picking some coefficients, a sub n, and you're twisting this, the sum over n to the it. And the conjecture says that as you move the, the parameter t, you get in our, on average square root cancellation for these sums. So again, this is a conjecture that arises from the study of the Riemann theta function. It predicts cancellation in the corresponding exponential sums. And in particular, it has as a consequence the Kakeya problem. So you, this is, so you see the connection with the previous things. In particular, the original motivation of this conjecture is that a positive answer to this will automatically imply an answer to the density hypothesis about the distribution of the series of the Riemann set of functions. It's a bound on a number of series that the Riemann set of function can have in a given region in space. So this is Montgomery's conjecture. And this is uh, another connection of the Kakea problem with exponential sums. And again, as in the other cases, while well, we have, we don't know how to attack the main problem. When we look at a simplified model, we can solve them using the polynomial method. So we have a positive answer to the analog of the Kakea problem of finite fields. This is a result of De Beer. He showed that if you have a finite field and a set in this finite field that contains a unit light segment pointing in every direction, then the size of the set has to be at least a constant times the size of f of the field to the end. So essentially it has to be the whole space. The only way you can have a set over a finite field that contains a line in every direction, which is clearly the analog of the Kakea problem, but over finite fields, the only way this can happen is for your set to essentially be the whole space, be very close to be the whole space in terms of its size. And again, the proof of this result uses the polynomial method and is in fact remarkably simple, which was surprised because this was a problem that was attacked heavily before for over a decade. So previous work on this problem employing different methods was carried out by Wolf, Burgain, Katz, and Tao, but these methods were all analytic, they were hard analytic methods. And what this idea of using the polynomial method brings is that there is some underlying algebraic structure in all in this problem as in other analytic problems that I'm talking about. They seem to have this underlying algebra structure that is very hard to detect using analytic tools, but come to view when you employ this kind of algebraic techniques that broadly speaking are termed the polynomial method. Now, one thing that it's nice about this one and another reason why it, this gave a lot of uh, impulse to the work on the polynomial method is because in well in, in this particular case we have some idea on how we can start to move into the problems that we cannot solve using the polynomial methods so we have all these different open problems that we cannot solve simpler models that you can solve using the polynomial method and when you move they are connected with each other and when you move around them you can find for example in this case that here for example you start to see how to start to get variants of the polynomial method that work for the original problems so in this case, the polynomial method has also been used mainly by Guth, but also by Salk, Katz, Rogers, Wang, and others to make progress on the original Kakeya and restriction problems. So this is another example of the kind of thing I was talking about. And I will give you one last example before I actually tell you about the polynomial method. And it involves arithmetic progressions. So as I said, the Kakeya problem follows from Montgomery's conjecture. And this deduction was carried out by Gurgan. In that another work, he showed that there is a tight link between the Kakeya problem and questions involving arithmetic progressions. To give you a very uh, informal idea of how this connection works, if you look at the Kakeya problem, that as I said, you can use a question about tubes overlapping in space. If you discretize this problem and you look like kind of a lattice and the points in the lattice that it's two into sec, if you do an adequate projection of that into a one dimensional set, the points inside the two will become points in arithmetic progression when you look at the one dimensional set. And so the question about tubes overlapping with each other becomes kind of equivalent to a question about a lot of arithmetic progressions overlapping with each other. So of course, now the question is, what about arithmetic progression? Does it also happen that the polynomial method arises there? Of course, because I told you that the Kakeya problem is kind of equivalent to questions about arithmetic progressions. If I ask you the same questions, obviously that of course the same methods will work. 
But we can ask other questions about arithmetic progressions than the ones that are equivalent to the Kakeya problem. So for example, the, probably the most well-known question about arithmetic progressions is the following. So it's an open problem to understand how small a subset of the first n integers must be in order to be able to avoid containing arithmetic progressions of a given length. So the classical work of Roth for progressions of length three and Semerade in general show that such a set must have density zero. So this is the famous Semerade theorem. The subset of the integers of positive density must have arbitrary long arithmetic progressions. And then a stronger quantitative bound was later given by Gowers, in famous work where he introduced the Gowers uniformity norm, which uh, also involve a similar kind of algebra extraction. And to this day, the best current estimate in the case, say in the case of provisions of length three, was established by Blumen's disaster. They show that such a set must have size at most this thing here, so n divided by log n to the one plus c for a positive constant c. And it was a big accomplishment. This answered the, this is a recent result, very great recent result that answered the well-known conjecture of Erdos in this case, and built some work of a number of people like Bateman, Katz, Burgan, Sanders, and among others. This is not an easy result. This result is, comes after finding the right way to develop Fourier analysis tools for combinatorics. And this is the motivation also for arithmetic progressions. This one tends to be interested in them, not just because of some obsession in arithmetic progressions, but because they are a great model example for the kind of linear problems that we can address using Fourier analysis and its generalizations. But still, it's not the optimal bound. One should hope to get a much better bound than this, but it seems to be extremely hard. But again, if we move, to a simpler model, we can in fact get a much stronger bound using once again the polynomial method. So over finite fields, the polynomial method was used to give a very simple proof of the following stronger estimate. So Krutlev and Pack introduced method, and then Ellenberg and Giswick independently found a way to twist it to prove the following estimate. If I have a if I'm working over a finite field, they show that the size of a subset of this field to the end containing no three-term arithmetic progression is at most c to the n for some constant that is strictly less than the size of the field. So if you look at it, this is a much stronger estimate. This gives you a power saving in the size of the set that does not contain an arithmetic progression. It's a very strong result. So for example, uh, the, the work of Bateman and Katz that I'm alluding to was a big breakthrough that was in this context, in the context of finite fields, and gave you a saving that is a power of a logarithm. Here, what they accomplished, Krut, Lepak, and Ellenberg, and Giswick specifically, is to give a much stronger bound power saving using the polynomial method. And the proof, again, as with the result of the view, is extremely simple because it, it again it seems that we have this algebraic structure that is underlying all these analytic problems that is extremely hard to make come out using analytic methods. But if you use the right algebraic approach, then it's just too easy to do it. Okay, so these are the examples I wanted to tell you about uh, how you have all these very interesting questions in analysis that uh, we don't know how to solve. They are connected with each other. They, they refer to different fields, but they are very much connected with each other, as I a little bit tried to show. And it seems that they have some important underlying algebraic structure that we cannot fully grasped, but when you, we look at simplified models, then it becomes kind of clear how to do it, and then it's very similar how we do it in all these different cases. So I don't know if there is any questions so far before I move into the second part of the talk, which is to um, actually tell you a little bit about how this algebraic techniques work, what they have in common, and how it can be applied to attack this kind of analytic questions. So let me then move to the second part of this talk, which is, so the first part, I gave you a very quick overview of a lot of topics that I hope I conveyed a little bit of the, of the feeling they have, this analytic, arithmetic problems that uh, are connected with exponential sounds, bound rational points and curves, and uh, big questions that we don't know how to solve, but when you simplify them, you get these models that can be attacked using this thing that I still haven't explained and which and is what I more or less will try to explain in the second part of the talk. 
So how does, what is the polynomial method and how does a typical application of it work? So this is a very standard example of how, how it's used. So suppose I have a set S, then a typical application of the polynomial, polynomial method, what it does is it finds a small subset A that controls the bigger set S in the sense that if a small polynomial vanishes on A, then it must also vanish in most of the original set S. So you have a big set S, and you kind of want to show that it has some algebra structure. To do this, you find a smaller set A, such that if you build a polynomial that vanishes there, it automatically expands and vanishes on the whole S. And since the set A is smaller, you can usually build polynomials that have some nice properties, some additional properties, and then these properties are uh, extended to the bigger set S by this property. How do you do this? There are many ways to do this. It depends very much on the context, but one typical tool to do this is to use a theorem. So the classical Basut theorem, in well, in one of its simplest shapes, says that if you have an algebra closed field and you have you have some irreducible algebra variety B in this field and you have some polynomial F, then if F does not vanish identical on B, the zero set of B will cut the variety B. And what Basut theorem tells you is that you have a good bound for the degree of this intersection. It tells you that the degree of the intersection of B with the zero set of F will have a degree at most, will be at most the degree of F, the polynomial times the degree of B, the variety. So simplest example of this is to just consider a line and a polynomial of a certain degree D. So for example, so if we know that a polynomial of D, so suppose I have a line and I have a polynomial of degree D, so theorem tells me that either my polynomial vanishes on the line or vanishes at on at most D points. Said another way, if we know that a polynomial of degree D vanishes on more than D points on the line, it must automatically vanish on the whole line. So looking back at what I said before, this is an example of where I pick a set, I can pick a, I can take, for example, S to be a lot of points on my line, a very big set of points. And then I just take a set A that consists of D plus one points. And then I know that if a polynomial of degree D, small polynomial vanishes on this set A, this D plus one points, it automatically vanishes on the whole line and therefore on all of my points. This is an example of how one gets this algebraic enhancement. enhancement. So how do you use this more precise, more concretely in the problems we were talking about before? So I'm gonna give you this example that maybe in terms of understanding the polynomial method is the most, uh, the most helpful part of this talk, hopefully, which is, goes like this. So I'm gonna focus on what happens if I have a set of lines. Uh, but the same idea that I'm going to explain will work equally well if we were considering instead of lines, lines we were considering tubes, arithmetic progressions, uh, residue classes, and stuff like that. So the point here is that uh, all the problems I mentioned before, what they, what they tend to have in common is that you're studying some object, again, could be lines, tubes, arithmetic progressions, distribution, residue classes, points, and curves, whatever. And what the, the, the common feature is that they are kind of overlapping with each other, they're compressed. So you to, as to avoid, for example, having cancellation in exponential sums and things like that, the objects that we're studying are tubes that overlap a lot with each other, arithmetic progressions that a set containing too many arithmetic progressions, a set that is distributed only a very limited number of residue classes. There's always some problem that involves kind of a, a problem about compression. So let me focus on lines, but as I said, the, the general case is similar. What can you do in this situation? So let me say, as it says there, that in reality, what I'm going to say should be, uh, should be done in dimension greater than two, but it's just easier to draw the two-dimensional sets. The idea that I'm going to say works equally well in two dimensions, but just the numerology doesn't work to get the right numbers and the equations you need to move into bigger dimensions, but it's the same idea. So I have a situation like this, like in this problems that I mentioned, you have a lot of things clumped together. You want to try to get some information out of that. One thing you can do, as I said before, is you try to find first a smaller subset. So look at this set of red lines. So I pick these red lines among all the lines, and I find a polynomial that vanishes on these lines. So suppose, and this is where the numerology fails, this, suppose I could have, find a polynomial of degree two that vanishes on the three lines. Of course, in dimension two, you cannot do this. You will need three, a degree three to get three lines. But in bigger dimensions, you can get a degree that is smaller than the number of lines. And that's what these things actually work. This is just for the simplicity of drawing it in two dimensions. So suppose I had a polynomial degree two that vanishes on these lines, and then look at the black lines. You will see that the black lines, each of them intersect three of the red lines. 
And so by what I said before, the Sutz theorem, this, this would imply that the black lines will have to actually be contained inside the, the, the zero set. So in fact, my polynomial will vanish on all the elements, which is the phenomenon I was talking about before. Vanishing on a small set implies vanishing on a bigger set. So this, this simple idea underlines a lot of the applications I mentioned before the polynomial. You start with some problem, tubes, lines, arithmetic regressions, distribution, received classes, fractional points of herbs, what have you. The elements you're studying are all kind of compressed with each other. They, they relate a lot with each other. And then you put a little bit of algebraic extraction. You, you make a polynomial managing a little piece of this uh, of the situation. And then this expands by an argument, like I mentioned before, the very fact that they are crammed together makes this algebraic extractor expand to actually incorporate all the elements or most of the elements you're dealing with. And then this gives, this is really useful because you only need to find a polynomial that vanishes on a small set. And that, since the set is smaller, gives you much more freedom to choose your polynomial and lets you do a lot of things with a bigger set. So that's the main idea of what's happening in all these problems and the kind of thing that we want to extrapolate. Now, the, let me tell you now what kind of difficulties arise when trying to do this. I'm going to now, from now on, focus on what will be another example, which is the study of patterns of lines and curves, varieties, and that kind of thing. So the polynomial method by its very nature, what it does is constructs a polynomial that has some useful property. But frequently, this leads us to study what happens inside the varieties that we have constructed with this polynomial. That's where things can get a bit more complicated. So for example, we can have a set of irreducible varieties of, them of some given dimension. For example, T could be a, a set of lines. That lines have an algebraic variety of a given dimension. So this will happen, for example, if you are studying points inside of a curve, that's the original problem. Or if we just were studying some problem in Euclidean space and we use the polynomial method to build a polynomial, and we want to know what happens inside the components of that polynomial, of that variety. And we would like to proceed inductively to approximate better and better and better the objects that interest us. But to do that, we need we, we want to find a polynomial that vanishes on the set that interests us. In this case, it will be the set T. But of course, we already know that T is inside a polynomial, inside of a variety B. So a polynomial vanishes on B, it is meaningless. We already know that to begin with. So we want a polynomial that vanishes on T without vanishing on B. That's one simple example of the kind of uh, things that we have to take care of. And we can do that. If the degree of t, for example, is sufficiently large with respect to the parameters of degree that I mentioned at the beginning, delta and the standard degree, it can be shown that we can find at least one such polynomial of degree at most this that vanishes on this element. So once you have the right set of sources, it's not something that is too hard, it's moderately hard to establish. And this is the kind of, it's an example of what, I'm, what I will try to now convey is that what we really want to do is get basic algebraic estimates we need some kind of sharp asymptotic version of this estimate. This is exactly the kind of thing that we need in order to make the polynomial method advance from simple discrete models to more complicated continuous models. So for example, we have this bound. And one feature that is important about this bound as part of the things that may seem to be useful to get these improvements is that it improves, as you, if you look at it, it improves with the degree of the variety. So if your elements are in a variety of very high degree, you, this estimate becomes better. And the reason why this is important is that one of the limitations and one of the complications that the polynomial method have is that you start with some problem, some complicated object, and you build a polynomial that uh, banishes some place you want it to banish. Sometimes this object is complicated, and this leads to having to construct a polynomial of very large degree. And this leads, in particular, to study varieties of very high degree. But the tools we have analytically to study varieties of high degree are very weak. And this is a big limitation. A lot of estimates that are good and useful when you deal with planes or things of low degree become much worse when dealing with varieties of high degree. So that's a, a big block that we have. But it turns out that there are other estimates, like this one here, simple estimate that actually improves with the degree of the variety. So there is this uh, the hope that we can get enough estimates that actually become better with the degree of the variety that cancel out the things that get worse with the degree of the variety. Usually one thing that, it, that is done very frequently in the polynomial method is to just use polynomials of low degree because to avoid the presence of these high degree varieties that we don't know how to deal with. In fact, and uh, 
what the idea is that some estimates may actually improve with the degree of being. This may allow us to actually avoid stop doing that, that in a lot of instances doesn't work or gives poor bounds and actually deal with a proper high degree variety that we want to study. So again, what we would like to do is to understand high degree varieties better from an analytic point of view. In fact, some problems, for example, for the Kakeya problem, it's already known that uh, if a counterexample exists, it will be essentially a variety of high degrees. So if we actually knew, had good quantitative analytic estimates, for example, for how many tubes can be placed near a variety of high degree, we will automatically solve the Kakeya problem, but it's not an easy matter to estimate these things. So for example, this simple estimate leads to another example of uh, the kind of things I'm talking about. So the following refinement of a result of Charlie and Philippon is the kind of example of uh, asymptotic algebraic estimates that one ends up needing. So some sort of an asymptotic converse to the suits inequality that says that if you have a variety of a given dimension, it tells us that B is an irreducible component of the zero set of some polynomials such that the product of the degrees of these polynomials is the most the degree of the variety. So if you look at Bessus theorem, every time in, you have a, a variety B that is in the zero set of some polynomials, every time you cut by these polynomials, you are multiplying in Bessus theorem by the degree of each polynomial. So you know that the degree of variety will be bounded by the product of the degrees. And this tells you that in fact, you can find polynomials where the other inequality works, where the product of the degrees is actually uh, less than a constant times the degree of the variety. So again, it doesn't really matter uh, in, for this talk at least, the precise statement of this, what I'm trying to convey is the feeling of the kind of estimates that we're looking for, just simple algebraic questions. We need some sort of quantitative analytic estimates about um, in an asymptotic regime. And another thing that these simple estimates can use for is to give a proof of the conjecture I mentioned at the beginning in the case of curves, simple proof using these methods. So that's well, this is some of the main things about the polynomial method, but there is another idea that plays a, an important part, and it was introduced by Guth and Katz. So Guth and Katz had this, introduced this variant of the polynomial method to study things in the Euclidean space. And what's good about their idea is that it actually takes advantage of the topology of, of the Euclidean space, which is good because much of the limitations is that are Many of the tools work for discrete things, but are hard to actually expand into the realm of Euclidean questions. So their idea was as follows. You have a set of points like this, these red dots. And typical application of the polynomial method, method will try to find a polynomial that vanishes on these red dots. Uh, they instead went through the path of trying to approximate these points in the following way. So I could pick a line there, another line and let's say take four lines. So instead of getting, trying to, and I get a polynomial of degree four, four by these four lines. And so what I'm doing, instead of trying to get the polynomial to vanish on the points, what I'm doing is approximate them or more precisely to partition the space algebraically by a polynomial of degree four in such a way that the points are well distributed. So if you look at it, I had nine points and I have used a polynomial of degree four to partition the space into nine pieces, nine cells given by the complement of this polynomial. And each of the cells contains just one point of the original set. So I have given a good partition of the points using a polynomial of, uh, of a given degree, in, the case, in this case, degree four. The idea is that this allows you to see some kind of rigidity in space that comes from the polynomial that you're constructing. So for example, suppose I have a line. Suppose I was trying to understand how these points intersect with a set of lines. So let's look, for example, at this blue line. So this blue line can intersect, intersect three of these points in this example. But the important thing is that because of the suit theorem, I know that the line can only touch my polynomial, my black polynomial, the, these four black lines, by the suit theorem. So the, this, this is a, the black lines give you a polynomial of degree four. So by the suit theorem, the line can only intersect these lines in four points. And so in particular, it can only touch four plus one, five of these cells. It cannot just move around and touch all the cells, because by the suit theorem, it can only touch the border of the cells in four points. So you get that this line can only touch a few of the cells. And the same for any other line that you have. So what's great about this idea is that it's, it's giving you this algebraic partition of space in such a way that you have a set of points and, it tells you, and a set of lines. And it tells you that each piece of space, each, each cell I have constructed can only contain a few points. Of, of your set of points. And at the same time, each line 
can only touch a few of these cells. So if each cell contains a few points and each line touches a few cells, this allows you combining those things quantitatively, allows you to give a bound for how many times the, point, the points on the lines can touch each other. And there was a remarkable idea that led to a lot of uh, breakthroughs. And in fact, it's another example of the kind of things that can be extrapolated to deal with uh, restriction problems and things like that, actual problems uh, in more continuous problems. And so to be precise about what they showed, what this method is, they show that if you have any set S and an integer M, then you can find a polynomial of at most a constant times that, a constant times M, such that the complement of this polynomial gives you this kind of partition into cells, such that each of these cells contains at most, so um, the number of the partition space into more or less M to the N cells, and each cell contains at most what you would expect ideally, s divided by n to the n elements of s. So you give me a set of points s and an integer m, I give you a polynomial of more or less that degree, m, such that the complement of this polynomial gives you a partition such that each cell of this partition is each connected component of the complement of the polynomial, contains roughly an equally distributed number of points. So to have more or less n to the n cells, and each of the cells contains more or less one over n to the n of the total number of points. And again, as was conjectured by Basuan Sombra, you can do the same over any algebraic variety where you avoid banishing on the whole variety with a polynomial that does a partition that does not banish identical in a variety. And again, you have this phenomenon where the larger the degree of B is, the better the partition. So when S lies inside a variety B of dimension D, we can get a, instead of 10 a partition like that, into m to the d times degree of b cells, which each of these cells contain the, the ideal number of points, s divided by m to the d times degree of b. So again, this was conjectured by Besson Sombra. It is again this phenomenon where some estimates, fortunately, some estimates actually become better when you deal with high degree varieties. And this is an example of that. So as I said, the idea that Guth and Katz introduced is that you can do this partition in space, you can get a very good partition and the previous results go in that direction of giving you the right partition. But then you have the problem of actually bounding how many cells are attached by the elements that you're studying. So for example, in the case of lines, it was an easy application of this theorem. But in general, you need some more complicated estimates. So we also need to bound how many connected components of the complement of a polynomial can be intersected by a variety of given degree and dimension. And this is linked with bounding the number of connected components of real algebraic varieties. In the end, this question of you have, you have a polynomial F, it partitions space into a lot of cells. And you, if you have an algebraic variety, you want to know how many of these cells are touched by this algebraic variety. And this quickly becomes the kind of this very similar question to actually bound in the number of connected components of a real algebraic variety. And here we have a classical result due to Milner and Thom that says that if you have a variety in the Euclidean space that is defined by polynomials of degree at most M, then the number of connected components is at most a constant times n to the n. This is a very classical result. And again, it's, it's rather wonderful that, so th these questions about algebraic things that we're talking about are motivated by the, all these analytic problems that are kind of fascinating and have a, reach a lot of different fields of work by a lot of different amazing people and leads you to this algebraic problems that when you try to optimize them and get the right uh, versions of them to apply them, you get into another field of, of, of great results. In this case, this classical statement of Miller and Thom comes into play to try to make this work. So this result and variations of this result have actually been used in the context of the good cat strategy that I just discussed. But in order to make these things work in the more ambitious contexts, you have a similar problem to what I mentioned before. So this estimate fails to be enough in general. Since the estimates we discussed before have savings proportional to the degree of B, they need to be complemented with bounds that have losses that are most proportional to the degree of B. So as I said before, studying high degree varieties analytically is a very complicated thing to do. We don't know how to do it well so far. In order to compensate for these limitations that we have, or in fact, even uh, even if we have the best estimates, it seems that we need to have this kind of uh, compensation. Some parts of the tools that one needs to use 
become better with the degree of the variety, like finding a polynomial vanishing in a set or just a polynomial partitioning that I mentioned before. But for this to actually be useful, we need that the parts that get worse when studying high degree varieties do not get too much worse. So the middle north, so we would like that the, the losses are, as I said here, since the savings we have are proportional to the degree of the variety, we would like losses that are also only proportional to the degree of the variety. While the middle north bound gives a bound that depends on the product of the degrees, well, actually the, the highest degree needed to define the, the real algebraic variety that we are studying. And that product, that quantity, the n to the n can be much larger than just taking the degree of the variety. So it can be substantially worse than having something that is proportional to the degree of p, which is what we would like to try to get. So building on work of Baroni and Basu and introducing certain ideas that involve constructing suitable envelopes of a given variety v, one can obtain actually variants of the milner thumb bound that depend on the degree of p and can thus be substantially stronger in practice. So here by envelope, I mean that what seems to be a common uh, feature of these things is that if you're studying these analytic properties of a variety, it can sometimes be hard to do it directly with the algebraic variety itself, but you can add like little patches to the variety where the variety gets complicated as some other patches that are also algebraic varieties but of different dimensions and degrees. And uh, once you add these patches, you get, uh, something that is a bit bigger, but simple to understand. And you can get much better bounds. For example, you can get a much better bound for the number of connected components that this object has. And in particular, this is perfect to study the question that we are addressing uh, in the polynomial method, which is how many cells can your variety touch? So you start with a variety, and if you make, if you make in the variety bigger, if, if a bigger set touches only a certain number of cells, of course, the original set, which is smaller, the original variety, will touch at most that same number of cells. And so in particular, we can get the kind of uh, quantitative uh, version of the Milton bound depends, depending on the degree of P that, we, that is useful for the other, for the polynomial method. So given a irreducible algebraic variety of dimension D and a polynomial F, one can show that the real points of B intersect at most a constant times degree of P times the degree of F to the D connected components of the complement of F. So you have a polynomial F, it partitions the, the com its complement partition space into its connected components. And this, and what you can prove is that a variety can, can only touch a constant times this formula, the degree of P times degree of F to the D connected components, can only touch that many cells. This bound is sharp and, and the good thing is that it depends on the degree of the variety instead of the degree of the polynomials needed to define it. And this allows you to complement well the kind of parts of the method that get worse with the degree of the variety. So what can you do with this? So we are specifically talking about uh, lines, curves, you know, questions about varieties. So in terms of uh, this kind of ideas, the classical result that you have in this question, in this, for this kind of questions is the summary throttle theorem that tells us that the number of incidents that can occur between endpoints and end lines in R2 is at most it's this number. So if you have n points and m lines in two dimensions, they can touch each other at most a constant times n to the two third, n to the two third plus n plus n number of times. So the classical result gives you a bound on how many times a set of points can touch a given set of lines. And one thing you can do with using all the previous estimates, they combine very well to actually obtain a generalization of this estimate, a more general sharp bound for a number of instances now, not just between points and lines, but between points and just arbitrary hypersurfaces of any given degree in every any given dimension. So this was an estimate that was conjectured by Elikas and Sabo, and a lot of interesting results were made in this direction before. And using this kind of uh, more quantitative version of basic algebraic estimates that I've been discussing before, they all fit together to give you a generalization of this summary total theorem to arbitrary hypersurfaces in any dimension. So that's one example of what you can do. But good and cats show that in fact, we can do much more than this basic estimates. So in, the, in their work, one of the things they, they, they did is to show that you can actually improve on the classical summary total theorem when you move to higher dimensions. So suppose we are in three dimensions, which is what they get the result. 
obviously you cannot strictly do better than the summary total theorem in general because I mean this the summary total theorem is sharp in R2. So in particular, if you're in R3, you can just pick any plane there and repeat the sharp example inside that plane. And of course, you will get the same numerology. And so of course you cannot just improve in general the summary total theorem in three in three, theory in three dimensions. But what they showed is that this is the only way in which you can fail to improve it in the sense that if you can guarantee that there are not too many lines containing any given plane, then in fact, you can improve the bound of the summary to the theorem. So, the, so you get better bounds in three dimensions for the number of instances between points and lines, unless a lot of lines are contained inside of plane. So as long as you can guarantee that doesn't happen, you get this result. And that opened the door also to a number of uh, results and questions that are in the spirit of, well, you have some objects and you want to know how they intersect each other. Is it the case that the only way that they can intersect a lot is if they're actually contained inside a proper sub variety, inside of a plane or inside of some set of that form? So I'm going to finish this talk giving you one last result for which I will need one last piece of notation, two last pieces of notation. So on the one hand is the notation for incidences. So you have, so suppose you have two sets of varieties S and T. Let us write this to refer to what we will call the incidences between S and T. So it's just you sum among all elements of S, the degree of S multiplied by the number of elements of T that contain. So you're standing some set S, it could be a set of points, T could be a set of lines. And then in that case, this is the usual idea of instances, how many times lines touch the S, but it applies to more general sets of varieties. And this other notation, I'll give you a, a couple of seconds to look at it, but the only important thing to keep in mind is that this thing, d sub m of t, measures how much, so you have a set of varieties t, could be a set of lines, a set of curves, a set of planes, whatever. This measures how much these varieties concentrate inside sub-varieties of a given dimension. So d sub m of t measures how much is the most natural way to measure how much that's they do the elements of T concentrate inside n-dimensional varieties. So again, I, the, the first one is just typical notation of how much the elements of S touch the elements of T. And the second one is just a way to measure how much the elements are concentrated inside something else. Remember that I told you that as Guth and Katz showed in the work, this is the abstraction to obtaining good bands. And given this, this is the last result I'll mention. One can prove the following kind of concentration estimate for algebraic intersections. So, so have, suppose you have two sets of irreducible varieties, S and T, and in this particular instance of the statement, let me just assume that the, the dimension of T is dimension of S plus one. So for example, S could be a set of points and T is a set of curves, or S could be a set of curves and T is a set of surfaces, and so on. Then, over any field, this works over any algebraic closed field, you can get uh, a bound for how much can the elements of S touch the elements of T. So for example, points and curves, how much the points can touch the curves, how many times a family of surfaces can touch a family of curves and that kind of thing. So it gives you this bound that this formula here works over any field. Number of instances between S and T can be at most the sum of uh, adequate powers of the degree of S, the degree of T, and the concentration of T on sub varieties, which as I said, is the, is the crucial thing. So this is a, a general bound. I will say a bit more, more about this in a second, but uh, I'll come back to this in a second, but let me tell you that two things. One, a stronger estimate can, the, the, the estimate I just mentioned is optimal over arbitrary fields, but if you move to, Euclidean space or things like that, you can do better. A stronger estimate can be obtained when you take the field equal to R. Again, it's an optimal estimate, but over R. The proof uses all the previous tools that I mentioned before, but it also, but it's not an easy consequence of those things. It involves a, a delicate induction on all the parameters involved. And the same method should extend to arbitrary co-dimension, co although I stated in the case of co-dimension one. And the good thing about this is that it gives you a unified way to treat a lot of problems. So the question is the Mary Trotter theorem, the Goodscott theorem, or just a lot of questions, just how can planes intersect, how can curves inside the surface intersect. It's a big family of questions that you can address in a more or less uniform way. 
And that uh, has to do with work carried out by, by a lot of people, a lot of very interesting work, like the Samaria Trotter theorem that I mentioned before and the work of Kuzan Katz, but also work by Pat and Shreer, Sal, Ellenberg, Havlitz, like Shepard, Fox, Kibir, Kolar, Eleke, Savo, Basu, Sombra, Gopi, Suk, Brass, Nauer, Doma, Tusek, Solomon, Solimoshi, Tao, Kildran, Kildran, Kaplan, Shustin, Tidor, Shu, Sao, and many others. The question about just, you have some family of varieties that interest you, the question of how they can touch each other, how they can intersect each other is a natural question that can arise in a lot of different forms. And this kind of gives you a uniform way to study them. So let me go again to this particular case of the results for finite fields and co-dimension one, you get this bound. And uh, it's many times easy to actually move from here and say that I don't really care about the concentration on T on all kinds of varieties. So for example, for the good cats theorem, we don't really care about how the set of lines concentrates on any variety, but specifically on planes. And, uh, and the same happens in general. It's one has a number of ways to, to diminish the number of varieties that we care about. But the main obstacle to get exactly what we want to get in general is the conjecture I mentioned at the beginning. So this kind of estimates lead to the following conjecture that uh, tells you that, uh, so this is an alternative formulation, just in case this rings any bells to anyone else. If you have an algebraic variety of dimension D, the conjecture is that you can find a polynomial of degree at most or less delta that vanishes on all the singular points without vanishing identically in B for some fixed constancies to them. So that all the singular points can be placed inside a polynomial degree delta. It turns out that in, for if you fix some set S and, uh, S and T that you care about, this result or the methods more precisely tells you that uh, you only care about the concentration on a very specific kind of sets, a kind of varieties, which are exactly the ones that one would expect, except possibly, for counterexamples to this conjecture. So this conjecture is true, you get exactly the best thing that you can hope for. It will automatically answer a number of open problems. For example, the are those distances, distinct distances problems in arbitrary dimension will follow immediately from uh, knowing this conjecture. But it's not just the direct applications that one cares about, but to finish, let me just say that an interesting thing about this is that, you know how I mentioned that we want to improve the polynomial method and uh, to make it deal with these more complicated situations. We know that the standard way to proceed to find structure is Besut's theorem. And Besut's theorem gives us a bound for the intersection pattern of, for example, if you have curves, so how can it intersect? And for example, Besut's theorem itself tells you have two curves of degree m and n, they will touch in n times n points if they're in a plane. But if you're in three dimensions, the curve may just not touch and maybe you, you have, can have a family of curves that don't touch. And, uh, and how much they touch, but this theorem, one thing is, tell, is telling you is that how much they touch has, is directly related with how much they concentrate inside sub varieties. So again, the usual idea of the polynomial method is try to find a polynomial advantages on this set. But uh, in many cases, it's just, just not enough. That's not a good measure of the level of concentration. Because you can have, a, for example, if you're working in 100 dimensions, you can have a very complicated set that is actually contained inside, say, a plane of dimension 90. You can get extremely complicated things contained inside a plane. It's a pretty simple set. What this result and this kind of ideas are telling you is that if you have a certain amount of concentration, this allows you to find a variety of exactly the right dimension where you, and in fact, degree two, where the, your variety concentrates, which is, seems to be an extremely crucial part in order to to make these things work better. Anyway, I, I hope that with this, I have conveyed you some idea of what is this polynomial method? How does it work? And Hola. ¿Sí? Ah, Miguel, perdón, porque yo me quedé sin internet. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, thank you for this amazing talk, Miguel. And again, showing that mathematics is only one. Um, 
we are stopping recording now and